Good evening, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to this evening's with genetics webinar on Huntington disease. My name is Susan Fernbach, and I'm the co-director of this series and of the Office of Community Engagement and Diversity for the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, this series is, sp is sponsored by our department and also Texas Hospital, but we are very grateful for the support of genetics and genomic services as well as um, a donation from Ms. Nancy Parkhurst. And really this support sustains this program. So this is the 16th year of the program and we're thrilled that you all are here this evening. I'm sorry, but we are not able to provide a simultaneous interpretation to Spanish tonight. Um, well, again, in the future. We will take questions at the end of the program, and please type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We have three speakers tonight who have um, really prepared careful remarks, and I'm very excited about this webinar tonight. It, we'll be listening um, hearing from Salma Nassef, from Madison Kruger, and from David Buckley. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about each one of them, and then we will get started. Salma Nassef is a board-certified genetic counselor and assistant professor in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. She is the Associate Program Director for the Baylor College of Medicine Genetic Counseling Program. Salma received her Bachelor of Science in Health Education, Health Education from the University of Houston and a Master's Degree in Genetic Counseling from the University of Texas Health Houston Health Science Center, Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. Salma received certification from the American Board of Genetic Counseling in 2012. She specializes in providing genetic counseling for preconception, prenatal, and cancer patients, as well as pre-symptomatic counseling for Huntington disease across Texas. Salma currently serves as the past president of the Texas Society of Genetic Counselors. Is a licensed clinical social worker in the Department of Neurology at UT Health, Houston. She is the social worker for the HDSA Center of Excellence at the University of Texas Health Science Center, Houston. She received her Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Texas A&M University and her MS degree in Social Work from Texas State University. Madison has been a medical social worker in hospital and clinical outpatient clinical settings since 2018. She has been working with Huntington's disease patients since 2021. And our guest family speaker tonight is David Buckley, an advocate for those with Huntington disease. David will discuss his family, family's journey with Huntington disease. So now let's get started and we will start with Salma Nasset. Welcome everyone. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to present today. Like Susan said, my name is Salma Nasset and I'm a genetic counselor in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics here at Baylor College of Medicine. We're going to go ahead and jump right into it, and today we're going to be talking about the genetics of Huntington's disease. So to lay the foundation and for all of us to get on the same page, we know that Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant genetic condition characterized by motor, cognitive, and psychiatric features. While symptoms fall into these three categories, it's often those motor symptoms that are the first to be recognized clinically, but in fact, those cognitive and psychiatric symptoms have likely been happening for many years. We know that the mean age or the average age of onset for HD is about 35 to 44 years old, and that the prevalence is about 9 in 100,000 individuals. HD has been around for a long time, and it was actually George Huntington, who was an American physician from Long Island in New York, who contributed to this clinical description of HD. He was just 22 years old when he first wrote a paper titled On Korea, which was published in the Medical and Surgical Reporter in Philadelphia. 
And while this wasn't the first time HD was described, it was one of the most comprehensive descriptions. And therefore it led to us adopting uh, the name Huntington's Korea. Fast forward about a hundred years later, when Dr. Nancy Wexler began studying the condition, we know that Dr. Wexler has both personal and family ties to HD to the HD community, as her mother and later she was diagnosed with Huntington's. But in 1958, when Dr. Wexler was attending a conference, she heard a Venezuelan physician named Americo Negretti first describing his observations of the disorder in the families in the remote villages of Venezuela. So then in 1972, she organized a research team. They went to Venezuela, which is where we see one of the largest communities of HD, and she started her genetics research. Fifteen years later, in 1983, the HTT gene was mapped to the chromosome number four, and it took about 10 years to identify where the gene, where we know that causes HD now is. So that's the HTT gene in 1993. So taking a step back, when we think about genetics, we start on the cellular level. So our genetic information is packed into tightly wound structures called chromosomes. And each of our chromosomes holds our genes, which are the units that provide instructions to how our body should grow and develop. Our genetic code is made up of DNA base pairs, A, T, G, and C, which are red, and these produce certain protein structures. HD is known as a triplet repeat disorder, meaning that within that gene, that HTT gene that causes Huntington's disease, there's a, re a region where there's repeated base pairs, and it's specifically those letters C, A, G. We all have these repeats, and what we do with Huntington's disease is we count up how many repeats there are, and each of those different strands present a unique protein that's made. I think about it kind of like reading a book and coming across a word that's repeated over and over and over again, and we're counting up how many times that word is repeated. So when we think about Huntington's and we think about those CAG repeats, we need to recognize that we all have two copies of the HTT genes, one that we get from our mothers and one that we inherit from our fathers. Within these genes, we have those CAG repeats. So typically, the normal amount of CAG repeats would be anything less than 26. So individuals that have less than 26 CAG repeats have a stable number of repeats and they're not at risk for developing Huntington's either in themselves or in their children. We know that individuals that have greater than 36 uh, CAG repeats are at risk for developing Huntington's. And then between 26 and 36, we know that there is this intermediate finding where we see between 27 and 35 CAG repeats. Only about one to 4% of those tested will be tested in this range. Individuals in the intermediate range don't themselves have Huntington's disease, but they are at risk of passing on an expanded number of CAG repeats to their children. And therefore their children may be at increased risk for Huntington's disease. We know that once we get past that 36 number with the HD causing CAG repeat size, we do see a little bit of variability with individuals testing at 40 or above, developing symptoms in their lifetimes, while individuals testing between 36 and 39 may or may not develop symptoms or it may be a later onset of those initial symptoms. Huntington's disease follows an autosomal pattern of inheritance, like we said in our opening slide, which means that both males and females are affected equally with Huntington's and that both can pass on HD to their children. Dominant literally means that if a person has HD, then there's a 50% risk for them to pass on HD to their children. And it's important to remember that pregnancy has no memory. So that 50% risk is for each conception. So each time and each new pregnancy. Of course, genetics is not straightforward. So there are some important points to remember with Huntington's disease. One is anticipation, which means that if a father is affected 
with Huntington's disease, they are more likely to, exp the, the CAG repeat number is more likely to expand in the next generation as compared to when it's a mother that's affected with Huntington's disease. And so this is a phenomenon that we know as called anticipation. We also know that the age of onset is very important um, in characterizing the condition, but there's no set correlation. So we can't say if you have this repeat number, this is when you'll first see symptoms, but we do understand that the more repeats we have, the earlier the age of onset. We typically look at family size as well as repeat size in order to help determine those age of onset questions that are, are asked. And then um, we also know that with expanded numbers of CAG repeats, there's also the risk of something called juvenile Huntington's disease. And this is when we see symptoms before the age of 20. It accounts for about five to 10% of all Huntington's cases. And we typically see those CAG repeats expanded greater than 60. It's much more severe. There's also an increased risk for seizures in up to 50% of cases. And we can also see speech and language de delay and as well as rapid, rapid decline. So when we think about genetic testing, the decision to undergo HD testing is highly individualized, it's highly personalized. And for the remainder of this talk, I'll be talking a little bit about the options of genetic testing for Huntington's disease. I think about testing kind of falling into three main categories, either pre-symptomatic testing, when someone knows there's a family history but doesn't know their status yet, diagnostic testing, when someone feels like they are starting to exhibit signs or symptoms of Huntington's and they're using testing to diagnose the condition or preconception or prenatal testing, when someone understands that they're at risk for Huntington's and is trying to make a pregnancy a test decision in order to determine the risk for their offspring. With the pre-symptomatic testing protocol, that's what I'll start with. Um, this is the area where I primarily practice. In my experience, individuals are seeking pre-symptomatic testing. They typically fall into one of three categories. Either, you know, they're, in their, they're 18 to 20 years old. They've grown up knowing that they have this family history of Huntington's disease, and now they're seeking information about their status. Or they're going through a milestone, a life milestone. So either graduating college or thinking about starting a family or just got married or getting engaged. So those kinds of milestones sometimes trigger people to come through pre-symptomatic testing. On the third category is really the people that are in their 30s and 40s when they start to think about when their family member first started to exhibit symptoms. So getting kind of closer to that age where they saw an affected relative exhibiting symptoms, and now they want to understand what their status is. So I want to walk you through the process at our center, but just to keep in mind that this may vary depending on which clinical practice um, you are, where you go. So in general, with pre-symptomatic testing, we do have two face-to-face -face visits, and now we're doing these via telemedicine, so still face-to-face, -face, but just with technology, um, for people requesting this kind of testing. So at that first visit, they meet with the genetic counselor, and, and as well as a psychologist or a psychiatrist for their evaluation. And then the second visit is their results disclosure. So really trying to streamline this process where you can get all the testing um, and consultations done within two visits. And then finally, following the results disclosure for referrals needed or post-test um, follow-up is needed, we would be, be able to set that up. So kind of just to give you some insight into what that looks like. Initially, uh, we, most patients reach us via either email or telephone. And the first thing that we do is explain the testing process. So really just talking about the nuances of testing, um, provide basic information such as cost and timing when the next available appointment is, and then really thinking about considerations with insurance and health plans. So in 2008, the federal law known as GINA, which stands for the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act was passed. And that provided protection against discrimination from medical insurances based on genetic information. But this law doesn't apply to life insurance, disability, or long-term care. So we always discuss that recommendation that individuals that are seeking out this pre-symptomatic Huntington testing consider looking into those policies prior to pursuing testing. 
And then in the genetic counseling session, that's where we sit down with the patient, we review their family history, we explain the risk, uh, we look at the benefits and risks of testing, their motivations for testing, and really make sure that they have an understanding of the underlying genetics of Huntington's, as well as their experience and perceptions of the testing process to understand what they would do with those results. We always uh, document and obtain informed consent prior to collecting any samples. Um, but once we are, we're done with both parts of that first visit, the psychiatry or psychology assessment, as well as the genetic counseling, we do coordinate sample collection. The psychology assessment um, is meant to be really a benefit and not an obstacle to testing. It helps identify people that might benefit from greater emotional support during the testing process. We always recommend that if you're going through the pre-symptomatic testing process, that you bring along someone that's your support person, whether that's a spouse, sibling, family member, or friend, um, just as another set of ears and eyes um, to help guide you through the process and help uh, you know, support you as you make these difficult decisions and learn this difficult information. And then we review the potential impacts of the testing. So both negatives and positives, talking about family planning, if that's something that's on the table, as well as financial planning and the dynamics of changing relationships. And then at our second visit, again, a face-to-face -face visit, we would have the disclosure of the results. After the testing um, and the disclosure of the results, we individualize what that follow-up will look like. So for some, that's a baseline neurological exam. For others, it's additional supportive counseling. For others, it's a mix of both. Um, so really that's just gonna be individualized based on the person in front of us. But to think about some of those other evaluations, sometimes it's a physical exam or neurological exam, or just an assessment overall for the full range so that you have some sort of baseline um, for where you are starting in that pre-symptomatic phase, as well as a consultation with a clinical geneticist or a genetic counselor. And then if reproductive considerations are on the table, we do talk about reproductive options. So I wanna just briefly talk a little bit about this as well. Um, we know that there are lots of different reproductive options. Some people choose um, natural conception with prenatal diagnosis. Others choose natural conception with no monitoring. So they don't want to know the status. Um, some choose pre-implantation genetic testing. So that's testing prior to getting pregnant through the IVF process. Um, some individuals would choose a sperm or egg donor or even adoption. And so to quickly just touch on two of the different um, testing options, prenatal diagnosis and then pre-implantation genetic testing, we know that prenatal diagnosis can be done for Huntington's disease um, using one of two methods, either CVS, which is a diagnostic test done between 10 weeks and 14 weeks of pregnancy, where a small sample of the placenta is examined in order to know whether or not the individual has that expansion or HD or amniocentesis, which is done 15 weeks after pregnancy. And if these are things that are of interest to you or something that you'd like to learn more about, we'd be happy to sit down and talk with individuals about these or I'd be happy to take some questions at the end of this session as well. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or genetic testing is an option for couples who want to reduce the risk for genetic disorders in pregnancy by using IVF and embryo testing. And really, this is the idea of only implanting embryos that are not expected to have the genetic condition of concern. We know with the PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing, it does require copies of genetic testing results, um, saliva samples or blood samples, really just DNA um, from the couple or from other possible family members, as well as a lot of time. Um, so setting up for this kind of testing for HD can range from anywhere from 15 weeks to 20 weeks, um, depending on the unique situation. And then also the consideration of the cost of these tests. So we know that the average cost for IVF with this pre-implantation genetic testing can range from 20 to 20 $25,000 per cycle. And it's important to remember that these costs vary from clinic to clinic and insurance coverage also varies from plan to plan. 
But in general, if these are things that are interesting of, of interest to you, or if these are considerations that you're thinking about, um, again, we'd be happy to sit down and talk more. And these are some just great resources um, to find genetic providers near you. So we always recommend to talk to your genetic counselor or your healthcare provider and set up a consultation to discuss options in more details. And I've listed a link here um, to find a local counselor in your area. And with that, I'm going to stop here, but I will be available for questions later on. Um, thank you again for inviting me to participate. Hi, my name is Madison Kruger. I am a social worker with UT Neurology, and I'm going to be talking about HD care management and different individuals that are involved in HD care. To start off, I'm going to start with disclosures. Like I just said, I'm an employee of UT Health Neurology. The clinic I work with is the HDSA Center of Excellence at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. The providers that I'm going to go over today that are involved in HD care are listed on this slide. One of the first questions that an individual or family connected with HD might have is, what do I do next? Where can I get help and what will be involved in that help and care? So we're going to explore those different roles of people involved in HD care today a lot more in depth. The first thing we're going to start with is the movement disorder neurologist. So this is probably the person that a family or an individual with HD seeks out first, um, making sure that they have a doctor that's going to understand the illness that they're dealing with, as well as um, have a good background in managing the symptoms with medications is vital and so important. Um, so as we know, HD does not yet have a cure. Um, but there are lots of different medications that can be used to help manage the symptoms of HD. So a movement disorder neurologist is going to be the person that manages these medications. They're going to provide education to patients and families about ongoing research, ongoing medications that are coming out. Um, the movement disorder neurologist is going to work with the rest of the HD team um, to provide genetic result disclosures, which we'll talk about more whenever we talk about genetic counseling. Um, and the movement disorder neurologist oversees the research that's going on in the clinic as well um, to hopefully um, work towards quickly a cure for HD. The next person involved in HD care is the neuropsychologist. Um, so the neuropsychologist plays an important role on the HD team through mental health support for both individuals and families with HD. From the decision to test for HD throughout the course of the disease, the neuropsychologist meets with individuals and their families to provide direction and care for mental health and emotional well-being. A neuropsychologist additionally completes important testing called neuropsychological testing, which is the NPT listed on this slide. Um, and this test takes a deeper look into the patient's cognitive functioning and this data can be helpful for both the treating physician, so data that gives a clearer picture of what's going on cognitively and can be informative for the family and individual as they try to make decisions about um, daily life functioning, driving, making decisions about money, things like that. Um, next is the genetic counselor, which genetic counseling is something that you just heard a lot about on the previous presentation, so I won't go into too much depth of it, but the genetic counselor is frequently one of the first points of contact for new individuals coming into HD care. Individuals with a family history of HD may decide to start the process of genetic testing at different times or never at all. Um, and meeting with the genetic counselor to get information about the risk of testing, what should be put in place prior to testing, and what to expect from the testing process can be discussed with the genetic counselor when considering or trying to get information on genetic testing. Um, so the genetic counselor is going to, of course, collect family history, uh, provide education to families and individuals pursuing gene testing and meet with families to disclose genetic test results as well as follow up after testing for check-in um, and provide resources and support for emotional well-being throughout the process. The next um, individual involved in HD care is the psychiatrist. Um, symptoms of HD vary, of course, person to person. 
but many individuals with HD experience psychiatric symptoms. Um, so involvement of a psychiatrist familiar with HD can be very beneficial for treatment. Um, it's beneficial for the psychiatrist to be involved as early as possible in treatment um, because subtle symptoms, subtle psychiatric symptoms may be present early on in the premotor phases of the disease. So before a person might develop motor symptoms, there might be some underlying symptoms of changes in mood or personality. Um, and they may, the psychiatrist may be involved in a similar way that the neuropsychologist is before testing um, to just check in on emotional well-being and make sure the timing of testing is appropriate as it is a huge decision to decide to pursue genetic testing. Um, and of course, the psychiatrist is there to take care of the behavioral symptoms throughout the course of illness um, through management of medications and other forms of treatment. On the subject of other forms of treatment outside of medications is the speech therapy side of things. So um, HG can cause changes in speech and swallowing. Um, speech patterns and changes in swallowing difficulties are two frequent symptoms of motor function in HD. Um, so speech therapy is valuable for both safety during HD care and can have a huge impact on an individual's quality of life throughout the um, stages of illness. The underlying movement disorder can affect every aspect of speech, resulting in different characteristics for different patients. Speech therapy may allow patients with HD to maintain speech skills uh, for longer periods of time, which of course has a ripple effect in other areas of life. Um, speech therapists may work with patients to learn safe swallow strategies um, for eating and drinking throughout daily life, as well as strategies to help with speech patterns. Further information on these topics can be found through HDSA's website. Um, a good resource for this is the um, topic called Living Well with HD under the Speech tab and HDSA's Family Guide series, Speech Language and Swallowing Difficulties is another good resource for reading um, and education on this topic. In a similar vein to speech therapy is the physical therapy. Um, physical therapy is an important intervention frequently used in HD care. Physical therapy is an intervention that can be used from the beginning stages of HD throughout the course of the illness. So getting set up into a routine with exercise and physical therapy can be helpful um, for both gaining and maintaining skills to prevent falls, maintain balance, um, and just all the things involved in, in getting around throughout the day. Um, this physical therapist works with patients throughout different stages of the disease. Um, physical therapy can actually be helpful in different ways throughout the different stages. So not just later on in illness, but actually very early on working on balance and improving walking can be those skills that are carried on throughout the stages of illness and can be very helpful in improving quality of life. And physical therapists also understand the sensitivity and the care of treatment. They help to understand um, that the disease does present differently in different people. Um, so motor symptoms might look very different from one family member to another. And they're very aware of that and are trained to help um, provide the best individualized care to maintain that balance and prevent falls. Next is the social work role, which is the role that I provide in the clinic. Um, so the main role of the social worker is to connect families with information, education, and access to community services. This is done through a variety of different ways. Um, big way that social work plays a role is just helping individuals and families as they navigate HD with coping with the diagnosis, um, symptoms, processing um, any mental health changes um, and treat and social workers treat the family system as a whole as well as the individuals involved. Um, social workers might address safety issues, employment, education, community resources, disability, et cetera, um, and find ways to overcome barriers to achieve health goals. As different social workers are involved all over the nation with HDSA, to find your local social, social worker, you can just go to HDSA's website um, and search under the social work tab. 
And then lastly, the others that might be involved in HD care are the medical assistants and the research team. Um, so the medical assistants are very important members of the staff in the clinic. So they make sure the appointments are made, vitals are taken, medications are and orders are sent to the appropriate locations. Um, and the research team meets with patients and families to gather information and data. Overall, this data plays a huge role in the hope for a cure or treatment for HD in the future. Lastly, some resources that I'm going to go over are where to go for more information and support. I've mentioned this website and this organization a few times throughout the other things that I've talked about, but HDSA is a wonderful website with a wealth of information involved in lots of different ways with HD care. And um, so through this website, you can find support groups, both local and specialized across the nation. There are a lot of virtual options available. You can find information on services in your area. So centers of excellence, as I mentioned earlier, social workers nearby to connect you with resources, news and updates about ongoing HD research and education on various HD topics. Like I talked about information on speech swallowing, um, managing behaviors, caregiver resources, um, just a variety of education for families and individuals with HD. Research is something that I've been talking about throughout this presentation, kind of under the surface and underneath all the other things that have been discussed. Um, but HDSA has a trial finder source on their website that is a good thing to check out. Um, you can begin by exploring the HD trial finder website or call the service staff um, through the number listed on the screen. Um, getting connected with HD research can be something that provides a new outlet, a new way to stay connected um, and hope for a cure for HD in the future. Um, whenever you go to the HDSA trial finder page, you'll find something that looks like this with a list of the different ongoing research projects, where they are. Um, you can also get connected to match with the different trials as uh, you just start an account and you can potentially be matched with trials that um, can provide more research and education to the community with HD overall. And then last thing, support continued. So, so some more resources that are available um, through different websites and support groups. So NYA is an organization through HDSA specialized for youth connected to Huntington's disease. So they do support groups, education, events, Overall, just support for young adults affected by HD in some way in their family um, or loved ones. And then helpforhd.org is an international organization designed to bring HD information, education, and resources to the world. HD Buzz um, brings HD research news. It's an excellent resource for staying up to date on all HD research in a way that's very relatable um, and easy to read through. And then the two websites that I discussed on the previous slides are listed at the bottom of this page. The first one is the HDSA trial finder where you can get connected and get information about ways to get involved in research. And then the HD trial finder where you can look at the list of, of ongoing research trials at this time. And um, so that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, to the HDSA Center of Excellence um, at Houston. I hope you've learned something about the different people that are involved in HD care today and have more information about the resources available um, to individuals and family with HD at large. Hello, this is David. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today a little bit about Huntington's from a family perspective. Um, it is a heavy topic and, and I'll be sharing from my experience. Uh, we do have some other folks that will share more clinical uh, information. Um, my, my goals for this talk are, are a couple of things. Uh, one, I'd like you to understand that you're not alone, that there's many other people that are dealing with this and, and, and we're working their way through it. Uh, number two is, is I'd like you to try and find hope in this hopeless situation. There's a lot of testing and trials and, and great support going on out there. We know more today about this disease than we knew uh, 5, 10, 15 years ago. So very grateful for that. 
Uh, and, and the primary goal, uh, the last one, is, is that my experience would be helpful to somebody else. It's going to be a heavy topic. Uh, there'll be some uh, some difficult portions of it. Not not looking for pity on it. I just want you to understand my experience, and uh, and hopefully that can be helpful to somebody else. Let me start by talking a little bit about my background and, and how I came to know about HD. And the reality is for me that HD has is, is been in my family my whole life. I, I don't remember a time where HD has not been part of it. Uh, in 1970, uh, my grandmother was diagnosed with it, which led my dad to do some investigating. And he found out it was in the family and, and learned a little bit more about it and the hereditary nature of the disease and uh, that that did uh, have an impact on family planning for him. Uh, Mom at the time was pregnant with the fourth child and, and dad was already starting to see some things in mom. Uh, grandma passed away from, from HD in 83. Mom was diagnosed in 1983 with HD. Now at the time, the, the diagnosis was made uh, just with symptoms. There was no genetic testing available at the time. And then, so it was symptomatic. Um, it, it really was, it was anticlimactic. We knew it was going on well before that. Uh, fast forward, 1989, mom went to a nursing home. 1997, mom passed from Huntington's. So I, I've had the, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but uh, I, I've seen the disease play its way through uh, multiple generations and, and most recently with my brother who passed away in uh, 2020. And so I, I got to see that all play out. Um, as far as uh, Huntington's finding out, it's an interesting journey for most folks. Either, like myself, you're going to be in a position where you know it's in the family. You've known it since, basically since birth, that it's in the family. Uh, other people find out later in life. And, and I really don't... Uh, uh, know how to address that other than to, to try and be helpful. But my experience is uh, I knew about it since I was little. And, uh, you know, so there's a couple ways to find out. One is symptomatic and the other way is genetic testing, which became a reality in 1993. And uh, the, the benefit and the curse of having that genetic test is you can find out. You can absolutely find out for sure if it's in, in your future. And it's a very heavy question to think about. Do you really want to know? Do you want to know that 5, 10, 15 years down the road, this uh, disease is going to impact you and there's nothing you can do about it right now? Uh, so that's a question that everyone has to answer themselves. And I know many people then try and be supportive of, of someone that they find out that their mom just got diagnosed with HD and now they find out that they're uh, uh, 50, 50 chance of getting it and their friends would encourage them. Well, you should find out if I was you, I'd find out. Would you really, would you really want to know? And that's a question every individual has got to answer. And, and for me, I never had the courage to find out. I never had the courage to go get tested, even though I could have in 1993. Once diagnosed, uh, what do you do then? What do you do? How do you, how do you move forward? What's it all mean? And again, for every family, it's something different. Uh, for my case, um, you know, I knew about it growing up, high school, college, getting married. So it, it's had an impact on, on how I've lived life. And it, as much as I try to uh, ignore the fact that it's there, it's been there. And uh, not too long ago, I was having a discussion with my brother who got tested many years ago. In the late 90s, he got tested and found out that he was negative. And uh, while relieved that he was negative, uh, he shared with me recently, he says, you know, uh, David, you and I have lived a very different life. I was able to put HD in the background and, and not think about it for all this time. And I realized that, that you haven't because I didn't want to find out. I would have loved to know that I didn't have it, but I didn't want to know that I did. Uh, because I knew there was nothing I could do about it. But what do you do? What do you do with kids? What do you do job-wise? What do you do career-wise? What do you do planning-wise? Me, from my, my standpoint, I, I attempted to the best of my ability to live life as if I don't have it. Uh, at this 
tender young age that I'm at now. I'm, I'm fairly confident that I don't have it because of family history and some other things. But, uh, you know, I don't have a definitive. And so I continue to try and live life uh, as if I don't have it. But it's hard to get away from that thought, uh, especially as a younger man, that, that every time I stumble on the steps, every time I drop the keys, every time I forget something, uh, every time something happens, that, that thought rushes to the forefront. Oh, I wonder if I have it. What should I do if I have it? And, and so as much as I tried to run away from that, uh, I never really could. And it, it's taken quite a bit of time to get comfortable with that. But for folks that find out that it's in the family and they've already got kids, they've already got grandkids, um, it's a devastating thing because it really falls into the what it could have, should have, what it might have. What could I have done different? What should I do now? How do I handle the kids? What do I do with the kids? Do I force the kids to get tested? Do I let the kids take their own course? How do I educate them about it? And many times families don't want to be involved. They don't want to know what's really going on. Um, and, and in some ways they, they act sort of like I did, where more or less put their head in the sand and ignore the whole idea. I get that. I really do. I understand when families want to do that. Um, Parents and loved ones want to step in and, and, and take over and try and dictate what the kids should and shouldn't do. But it's a very difficult and it's a very uh, touchy, uh, touchy subject to get into. Uh, so I can understand it from, from a lot of ways. Understand this, that if someone's got Huntington's, uh, at, at some point they will no longer be able to work um, and, and hold a career. They will need some, some very significant uh, caretaking as they start to decline, which is kind of a good segue into, okay, now what? How do I take care of somebody? How do I walk into that caretaker role? Um, how do I handle the, the, the changes that I'm going to see? And for everyone, it's different. There's many people that I know that, that have been able to keep their spouse or loved one at home through the duration of the disease. Uh, there's others that, that have chosen to put their loved one into a nursing home or assisted living or, or some other uh, way to take care of them. And, and I don't sit in judgment or, or condemnation of any of that. Everyone's got to make their own choice on what's best for them. Um, my experience, again, that's what I have to work with, is my experience was, was having my loved ones in a nursing home setting uh, for their welfare and for the rest of the family welfare because it, it really is a family disease. It impacts all parts of it. And you have to understand how uh, the, the sick person is gonna impact the, the operation of the household. Um, particularly in the, in the case of, of my brother that I'm most directly associated with, uh, we chose to put him in a nursing home, although I did dabble with the idea of having him live with us, but. Uh, I know now, and I really knew then in my heart of hearts, it would have a tremendous impact and a detrimental impact on the operation of our household. Um, so uh, one of the things that you're going to deal with and you must come to grips with dealing with Huntington's as a loved one, as a caretaker, is there's going to be a lot of stress that you feel because there's not more that you can do. At this time, there's not a cure for this. There, there are drugs that help with the symptoms. Uh, help with the, the, the sleep and the psychosis and the movement and, and all kinds of other things, but there's no cure. And, and the difficulty in that whole process is to a moving target. Today, you may think you've got the perfect uh, balance of medications to take care of everything. Tomorrow, something changes. Tomorrow, you're dealing with a completely different person. You're going to deal with situations where the, the, the logic disappears. In that person. They're making requests that, that uh, don't make sense. And oftentimes, uh, I've seen people that don't understand Huntington's get, get kind of sucked into this thing where they uh, try and appease every, uh, every request that a person has. And I don't intend that you should be cruel, but, but you've got to understand what you're dealing with. And what you're dealing with is someone who really isn't dealing in a logical manner anymore. Uh, it's going to be difficult. I would encourage the caretakers to make sure they take care of themselves. And that can be a difficult thing. Uh, Huntington's will isolate you. 
it will pull you out of the normal flow of society if you allow it. Um, so you've got to be really careful to make sure you're taken care of, because if you're not taken care of as a caretaker, there's nothing you can do to take care of your loved one. Um, it, it is a daunting task that you're up against um, in, in looking at it. And one of the things that I realized uh, some time ago is I don't remember what mom was like before HD. So I've inquired of some of my aunts and uncles that, that knew her back then and have had good conversations with them about what mom was like before Huntington started taking over. And, uh, you know, just understanding the kind of person that she was isn't what was reflected at the end of her life when she was uh, gravely impacted by Huntington's. So there is a, a tremendous uh, change and loss that takes place over time. And that is one of the most difficult things to deal with is just the duration of what it takes to uh, have a person go through Huntington's. It's a 15 to 20 year uh, incremental loss of the person that uh, it's just difficult to take. It's hard to watch. It's hard to endure. But, uh, you know, you, you, you have to push through. Do the best you can. Understand you're not alone. Understand you're not alone. Understand you're not alone. There's support groups out there. There's all kind of uh, uh, doctors and clinics and, and people that will help you if you allow them to. And, uh, you know, get into a group. Get into a group and, and uh, find support there. And do the best you can to take care of your loved one. It will be a daunting task, but it will be worthwhile. That's what I know. That's what my experience is. Uh, I've talked to many people in all kinds of different spectrums, uh, all different uh, positions uh, within Huntington's as far as where their loved one's at, where they're at. And I know it's difficult. And, and I'm happy to help with any experience that I can offer. And I look forward to discussion after this video. And, and I'm open for any questions that you may have. I appreciate you taking time to listen to this uh, the webinar, learn more about Huntington's. And, uh, I wish you a great day. God bless.